Thanks, everyone. I know it's a very unpleasant semi-postprandial hour, so I will try to keep this uh, short and not as sweet as dessert, but <laughs> almost. <laughs> so um, uh -huh. I click and it starts, or what's going on? Yay, I guess so. OK, so um, the, my, my, the talk is about best screening tool for diverse patient populations, and I should address coronary artery calcium list score, genetic risk assessment, and beyond. So first of all, thanks. I have no disclosures pertaining to this talk, but I would also like to thank once more all my hosts for, for being uh, uh, one of the program faculty this year. It's quite an honor, and I'm truly humbled because this is only the second year in a row. Last year, I had the pleasure to speak in a session where Dr. Ferdinand was chairing in an, uh, we discussed diabetes in women and women of diverse populations. So thank it's additional pleasure to to, to meet Dr. Ferdinand live this year and and, and uh, be here in Arizona with everyone. So after me, uh, Dr. Belenconda is going to talk about Inoka and Oka and best management. Uh, Dr. Ferdinand will address the lipid lowering, which is why I didn't uh, drown the fish too much in my talk about it because when you're talking, you know, when there's a guru in lipids uh, talking after you, then you don't dare to, to uh, talk too much about it. And finally, uh, we'll, we'll have the panel discussion with Dr. Roberts, whom uh, thank you again for, 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 um, for this opportunity. So when we talk about cardiovascular risk per se, when we go backwards in history, we remember, first of all, the um, uh, Framingham Heart Study. but Although I have really given my earnest, and it's been 70 years recently, only a couple of years ago we celebrated 70 years of Framingham Heart Study, uh, I tried to, to locate the exact percentage, and I invite everyone who has the correct number here, whether they're live here or somewhere uh, over Zoom or on Twitter, uh, if someone can give me the correct uh, number or percentage of black population enrolled in the Framingham Heart Study? I thought so, but uh, you know, sometimes when you Google, sometimes, thank you Dr. Hayes, less than 5%, because you know, regionally when you Google uh, things, sometimes things you can Google out when you're in the States and things you Google outside the United States, you don't always get the same info. So thanks, now I feel much better. But fortunately at the same time, um, there was another study that was actually designed um, aiming to learn about disparities, almost by the same group of people, meaning Ansel Keys and Paul Dudley White, and it was the seven country study. I agree that the seven country study at the time didn't have diverse populations in terms of uh, black populations worldwide, because besides the United States, there was Finland, Netherlands, it Italy, Greece, Japan as as a diverse population setting, right? And finally, former Yugoslavia and the three Serbian cohorts, I'm the third generation investigators for the study, we have recently examined the survivors of the 50-year follow-up. Now, when both of these studies were designed, we were not even recognizing that women had the right to have coronary artery disease, right? At the time, we believed it just happened to men. So can we judge them? For that, well, not so much, but something that I appreciated a lot and which I confirmed in our sub-analysis is that actually all men, and they were all, seven country studies included healthy men over 40 who have seen every five years. It turned out that actually healthy men over, who, were, who were included in the, in the study and who were consequently followed every five years, those who had hypertension or subclinical forms of coronary artery disease, as we say in modern terms, Actually, they had, if their parents had uh, hypertension or died suddenly from coronary heart disease or stroke, it was, mo it was more often that it was the mothers, which actually uh, compares to the news that we, it's not news anymore, we know that we actually get mitochondria from our mothers. So that makes all the sense in the world for hypertension. So, but how did our risks assessment change from there? We have plenty of guidelines. We have them here. We, we discussed recently that we have the 2017 uh, Joint Guidelines on Hypertension. Then we recently saw the, the, the primary prevention guidelines that were the first actually to acknowledge uh, 
sex differences and risk factors about which Dr. Miko spoke earlier this morning. We recently had a weight loss strategies for prevention and treatment of hypertension scientific statement from the AHA. Also, the promotion of a healthy lifestyle in clinical settings, but dietary again. But if we also look at the guidelines there, meaning across the pond in Europe, frankly, it was only this year and in a very uh, modest way acknowledged the fact that women who uh, suffered either uh, premature delivery or a st stillborn child were, deserve some kind, of, some kind of treatment. And what is most peculiar, although Europe is not for at least last 40 years, uh, Europe is for sure not a monochromatic region. We will agree on that, right? So, sadly, European guidelines don't address the issue at all of race as such. And finally, when we get, what do we have from the guideline standpoint that addresses uh, health disparities in women? After actually the 2011 uh, guidelines that appeared by the ACC, the paper that Dr. Bond mentioned earlier this morning in which we also addressed the issue of risks that are present in women who, who um, had different forms of adverse pregnancy outcomes. The uh, very modest report uh, that appeared only earlier this year as a consensus, and if you look actually also at this group of people who wrote this uh, um, article, you will also realize that the same, I dare say, racist ideas that we see across the pond, you actually see a bunch of people who all belong to colonial powers in Europe who discuss everything but race. And frankly, if you read it, it's nicely written, but no practical advice at the end. And finally, we have only the call to action, which was the maternal health and saving mothers that we have recently seen by from AHA. Now, Women are still not small men, and we know that all our guidelines, we have repeated it ad nauseum all this day, I believe, are based on the results that we have seen on studies conducted on, on men mostly. And what was most shocking for me, I have to admit, this was I consulted the WHO website while I was preparing this talk only less than a month ago, and when you look what are the risk factors for cardiovascular disease? According to WHO, they claim that it's actually behavioral risk factors. But no one discusses so much. There is a modest, you will, I, I don't dare to touch someplace where I'm not sure where, whether this is the pointer. Sorry. Nope. Okay. Um, Bottom line, even WHO doesn't discuss the issue that we women also can have heart disease and that women of different ethnic background had different levels of risk, which was frankly for me appalling. I don't know what I did. Okay, so finally we come to the title of my talk. If you review, <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> But you know, that is what, when you accept giving a talk on a, on a method that is not widespread in your hospital setting, because frankly, a good portion of Europe doesn't do CAC at all. We love to cast people. We don't CAC people, but we love to CAC, cast people. So I actually, when I was preparing my talk, reviewed literature from scratch as if I was talking about something that I have never heard of. It's not true, of course I have. It's just that we sadly do not, in good portion of Europe, practice CAC during, in risk stratification. But fortunately, some other corners of the world do. And a recently published article from the group of authors from Saudi Arabia has confirmed the, the, the um, CAC has a good tool to recognize high-risk population in women from the region. We had, I would like to also mention the, the paper uh, by Dr. Kelkar in which long-term prognosis uh, was, uh, was confirmed uh, with, uh, in women with um, low and intermediate risk women in both men. 
then an, and then a paper also by uh, by uh, Dr. Dr. Miko's group where we had a good proportion of women included in the MESA trial, which we confirmed, but, but sadly, although I was awaiting some spectacular news from AHA, uh, I didn't find anything, if you can still correct me, although I spent two days looking at everything that was live and on demand, nothing earth-shattering have I heard about CAC. So the good news is yes, the Miami Heart Study uh, presented uh, during, uh, during AHA 2021, did have almost 60% of women, but those were Latina women, no black women included. What happens with the genetic testing? The genetic testing is we know, and if we follow the, the AHA scientific statement that appeared last summer, is something that is sadly not offered and now I have sadly a faulty slide and that's my fault, sorry. So there was supposed to be two other pictures on top of this one discussing the, the, sub, uh, um, the subtypes of genetic testing that we offer for, from familiar for FH and for LPLA. But sadly, according to currently available evidence, we don't offer so much of the testing to the populations that actually need it the most. So, when we come to the best screening tool for diverse patient populations and we come to the beyond, I just like that we all actually start talking to our patients before opting on a diagnostic tool of a choice. Why? Because our apparently healthy young adults of today may have been conceived by art. And Dr. Rubinson will agree with me that we had a very nice publication, not so not so, not so while ago, in 2018, which was actually, we have the, the, the adults who are 30 and 40 years old today. It was a European cohort from one of the most prominent centers in, in Switzerland that run, run the analysis and has confirmed that basically all children conceived by art, different art technologies in their centers in the 70s and the 80s have endothelial dysfunction, promoting hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. Our young adults of today may identify themselves as everything but cisgender women that we might see. And I, when I was making this slide, I had no, I, I didn't know the details of, of Dr. Miko's talk. I wasn't paying much attention to it. But yes, we see women in our clinics, but we don't see if they, when we see them and they physically look as women, and it's going to be something more widespread, we don't know their risk if they really uh, transition in the meantime or not. Also, our patients may seem of the ethnical background that they might not be. And that is the, that is our vive les différences uh, pleasure, thank God. They may have experienced life-threatening settings due to migration and displacement. Sadly, uh, over 60% of women who are currently displaced, and according to UNHCR, are women. And these women, sadly, don't get neither basic um, basic support in terms for their regular um, period needs, nor they get reproductive care, let alone, um, uh, let alone risk certification when we know that the displacement and migrations that we live and we see day to day increase the risk. We also know that the patient we see can suffer well-concealed day-to-day struggles of financial insecurity and caregiving. We have data for that in the United States where black women who struggle paying back their college tuitions or their university tuitions, and there are small reports, there are not huge studies or trials, but there are retrospective analysis that have been published over the last 10 years that confirm increased risk in women who struggle financially, especially women of color. Women we see in our clinic may have also experienced fertility issues, adverse pregnancy outcomes of stillbirth. We have to also talk about those even if we're cardiologists. They may live in zip codes burdened with adversities as street violence. Additional street violence in different zip codes is something that increases risk, and we have reports on that in the United States. And they also may not be even aware of pollution as a risk factor that we see and even in so-called modern and affluent port portions of the United States, but the risk is there. 
So my beyond of the 21st century healthcare is talk to your patients before you decide what you can, how you can stratify their risk in function of what you have available in your setting, what is covered by the coverage that the patient has. And of course, if you have a possibility to include someone in a registry or a trial that will offer them additional diagnostic testing and follow up, that is something that is actually the best you can do for them. So thank you once more, and I promise Dr. Bond that I'll be done in 15 minutes, and I did it instead of 20. Thanks a lot. <laughs>